I'm happy to announce our first ever members only fishing tournament, the Halloween Bash on Tourney X. The tournament is going to go from October 12th until midnight on Halloween. Registration is open now and it ends Monday, October 14th at midnight. You must be a Patreon supporter to enter this competition. For the $20 entry fee for the tournament, I am guaranteeing $100 for the biggest largemouth caught, $100 for the biggest smallmouth caught, $100 for the biggest rock bass, $100 for the biggest sunfish, and I'll be paying out a first place and a second place, and those numbers will be dependent on how many people sign up. Again, the tournament is $20 for Patreon members only, and to be a Patreon member and to help support Fishing the DMV, it's only $6 a month. And for that $6, which is less than a pack of Senkos or Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 15% off their orders to 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members only content, our monthly photo contest giveaway, and of course, for this month, our Halloween Bash Fishing Tournament. Again, if you would like to join this community and join this really cool fishing tournament, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live, the last day of September until we get to spooky season of October here. And it seems like half the eastern seaboard is underwater. You are flipping into somebody's living room tonight. And the place that really got it the worst, the Carolina, Tennessee area, heart goes out to them. A place a little bit northeast of that is the Smith Mountain Lake area. And I guess it's timing or whatever, but I have on the man, the myth, the legend, Billy Coles today. He's going to be coming on the show to discuss really how to fish these high water events. We're going to see what's up with him. And if you guys have any questions, just let us know. So without further ado, let's get him in here. All right. Can you hear me, sir? Uh, yeah, I can hear you fine, man. It was because I had YouTube up on the other tab like an idiot. <laughs> so you have had a busy life. I mean, did you want to give everyone kind of a sit rep of, of everything that you've been up to? Uh, yeah, sure, man. You know, what's funny is that intro is coming in, though. Just to tap on the weather real quick. I just got a flash flood warning for Smith Mountain as well. So yeah there's that there's that but yeah man life's been life's been good um you and i chatted you know just for a couple minutes before did a little family time to montana which was nice just to get a little bit of a break we we went uh seven years ago to the kalispell like glacier area and taylor and i were like very lightly playing with the idea of oh it'd be cool to own something out here and and so we wanted to bring charlotte and kind of see how she flew and and do that so that, that was a cool trip we decided against that uh just because it's so far yeah so far it's changed quite a bit uh, really yeah a lot of covid like money came in it's insanely expensive to buy there now and then um the lakes kind of just or not the lake well there is a lake there flathead lake but um a massive lake actually i was like oh how close to smith mountain size wise is it it's one hundred and ten thousand acres yeah, it, it takes like 45 minutes by car to drive around it. So, mm. um, but yeah, dude, we just, we just went and kind of relaxed. Honestly, we just slept and like had good coffee and good meals, did a tiny bit of hiking with Charlotte. So that was, that was pretty nice. And then guiding seasons, like we talk about kind of every fall kind of slows down for me. I'm a little bit busier than, than say the last couple of years in October. I think that's because a lot of guys want to kind of get that September funk um bite down which it's definitely funky out there we'll we'll talk about that a little bit and then you know you, you mentioned it when we were on here before i launched that paddleboard business that we can kind of talk about a little bit this time but launched uh launched another business on top of all the other businesses um in a hopes that one of them takes off enough to where i can just have one job um but it's good this is business number 15 16 yeah this, i mean like goodness gracious yeah this feels like business number seven <laughs> number four officially um uh, but had a really successful launch with it and nice. uh and really really excited about next year we actually have a, a pretty good opportunity with the state park system um that's a whole different like whole different demon to kind of mm. handle as far as dealing with the government contracts and requests yeah. and, and all sorts of stuff like that but big opportunity there and then We'll see. We'll see where that one leads, but uh, I'll probably be leaning on the fishing community quite a bit um, up and down the East Coast, at least regionally, just to see if we can get some connections with like marinas and re restaurants and campsites and stuff like that to see if we can uh, 
get that business launched pretty good. So besides that, dude, baby girl's doing awesome. Wife's doing awesome. Jumping into insane wedding season, 13 weeks in a row. And then, um, and then get a break. So. Dude, that's absolutely insane. Everything you have. Then of course, yeah, we'll definitely promote, uh, your paddleboard business. Is there a link yet or anything else like that material? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so, and I can jump into it a little bit now if you want to start with that. So go for it. Yeah. Yeah. The business is called paddle box. Um, essentially over the last two years, I've developed with a business partner, a software kiosk system that holds paddle boards vertically. Um, and we can, you can pull up the website. I don't know if you want to share it or not. There's some, there's some shots on it or the Instagram or whatever, but no, basically think like, uh, rental scooters in the city. Um, like if that business morphed with like a red box. And so we're able to put these locations anywhere that there is sun and, um, and cell phone signal. So, um, it's, you know, it's completely self-service. You literally walk up to it, put in your information, sign a liability waiver, lock on locks, go paddle for an hour, go paddle for two, rent it for days, uh, rent it for up to a week. And, um, we're, we're hoping that we can put these into remote locations, um, to where everything is kind of getting people to go to these areas. Like we really designed this kind of in the thoughts of like a couple things. One marinas and restaurants and parks and campgrounds and stuff have uh yeah that's it right there have um you know a hard time getting help that was like a big thing right like they're all hiring like 16 year old kids that hate their jobs and don't want to talk to you anyways to essentially rent a paddleboard um or a canoe or a kayak and we're expanding into those kind of things um pretty quick but essentially we wanted to help places with overhead, not having to hire people, and then just doing revenue splits with them. So it's completely automated, runs on solar power, um, Hmm. hardware verified that it gets returned. And uh, yeah, so we've been working on it for two years, super, super pumped that we got it out. It had a location at Smith Mountain um, for August and a little bit of September. Obviously, we're going to talk about the weather in awful September. So the rentals were super, super low. But, um, you know, we're expanding this regionally who knows how many years from now, but hopefully, hopefully nationally at a point where we're just going to kind of service these and have field techs to kind of go out and do them potentially franchise at a, at a possibility. Um, but if you have anybody that, that listens to this or wants to reach out, it's paddleboxco.com. Uh, we can talk about getting a location set up, uh, where you're part owner, where you're getting a revenue split, you can buy these outright and get a better revenue split. We have a bunch of (coughs) offerings for it, but, uh, yeah, there's not too many companies like this out in the U S so, jumped on it and we'll see what happens with it. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. So if you are a uh, millionaire or a billionaire and you'd like to get in on this bad boy, just please, I'll put a link in the episode description for when this bad boy gets re-uploaded tomorrow morning. Yeah. You don't have to be a million millionaire or billionaire. I mean, they're, they're actually not as bad as um, you would think to, to get built and, and get boards in there and everything. So we'll see. It's, it's, uh, it's exciting. Unfortunately, I think that's the way the world is going is people don't really want to talk to other people. And, uh, I know a lot of these businesses that I talk to that are super excited about it. They just don't want to have to hire some, there's not enough money in rentals yeah. like that to justify paying somebody 15 bucks an hour. Um, so if they can get it automated, cool. So do you ever think like the human experience will be kind of like this hipster thing again? Cause I I'm thinking like, you mean hippies? guys say, so example is like with me, as you guys know, I have a YouTube channel. And if you want to talk to Google, there is no one at Google. Everything is right. AI. And or Facebook. It I, it, God, it's a nightmare. And so, or Squarespace. And so I would almost pay more money if I could actually call a damn person. And I wonder yeah. when we're going to hit to the other end of this thing where it's like, oh yeah, I can go talk to a human again. Like that's going to yeah. be awesome because I feel uh, like eventually... So I follow a lot of sales guys just because that literally is basically what all my businesses are is, is sales gets it started. So a lot of people think that it is going to do that. They think it is going to AI is going to correct to where in-person sales actually becomes more valuable. Yeah. than it currently is because if all these businesses dump everything into AI as far as like customer service or a sales rep or whatever until, you know, you got to go through five steps to talk to a human. Um, if you're just the dude that you pick up your phone. Dude, I tell every young kid that I take fishing when it's like a dad and the two boys or whatever, and I'm asking them about high school or college or whatever, I literally tell them, just pick up your phone and you will be fine. Like you will make enough mm-hmm. money to survive in America. If you start a business and just pick up your phone, it's, it's not that hard. You could do whatever you want to do. Why is that so hard? 
I mean, you're a person like, and I've been in the boat with you. You have like 38 phones. You have like a holster yeah. within they're color coded. <laughs> is that just a skill that like high school or, and I'm not trying to be a boomer here, but is it, or yeah, is it anyone sure. in general that doesn't have the skill? You know, I don't know. I talk about this. I talk about this with my wife all the time with raising Charlotte is like, okay, if she ends up being an only child, how are we going to like get her comfortable? But like, dude, my parents did things like when I was like 10 or 12, they'd make me order the food for everyone at the table. Like, mm. uh, please and thank yous to random strangers or like talk to someone randomly. Like I was just kind of taught like to just how to like bring up conversation quickly. Um, and so I don't, I just, it's not weird to me. Um, and we were actually talking this weekend at, at the wedding. This was, it was a super cool couple on Saturday. Um, and the best man speech, this is so off topic from fishing, but it's fine. That's great. Uh, That's what I like about this. <laughs> this is just kind of like the human of, 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 of me is so this bride and groom, the, the best man's toast was about spreading joy and that the groom is just like a dude that just, that's what his whole life's like deal is that's what he, he identifies like that's the type of person that he is um, and we were just, yeah and we were just talking on the way home and we were just like how do you like just do it um so me and taylor and then my brother-in-law does videography for us too and then my hmm. sister-in-law watched charlotte and right before we left that night i was like hey guys like let's take sunday and like randomly to some per person like just spread some small amount of joy um so i think Brittany did like um, uh, text message to someone she hadn't talked to in a while or whatever. And we did brunch and like just wrote something nice on the ticket or something like that. Like, I don't know, dude, there's just the, the way that the world runs now, it's so isolationist. So I think yes. any sort of, um, extra, which it's not really extra. It's just being a nice person. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I think can go a long way, but back to like the sales side of it, it's the same thing, man. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to buy a truck this week. Same thing. I had a 30 minute conversation with the guy selling me the truck. We probably talked for 20 minutes about fishing. Um, so hopefully it gives me a good deal. Well, no, but it, it, it is a superpower. And I, I have more and more high schoolers and stuff, especially up this way, talk about yeah. this. And we talk about the the death of the fishing industry and like, oh, you can't just go out there and win tournaments. It's like, no, but there's this this person side. And I, I ran a landscaping business, a strength and conditioning business for 17 years just talking to people it is such a weird superpower that is lost because it was at least for my generation up in Northern Virginia that you have to learn how to code and lock yourself in a room but it's like if you can just hold a conversation you yeah. will feed yourself a lot you will do just fine I mean dude part of the part of the deal with our wedding business is we're not introverted artists we're extroverted like planners slash photographers that like have the skill and have the creative side in our body but we know that like it's it's not ideal. Like I wouldn't want somebody at my wedding that like was quiet or like mm -hmm. just cold. Um, so we sell our business like that all the time. And I do the same thing with guiding, man. I think you and I have talked about this before. Most guides that I have gone with in my life, whether it's fresh or salt water are crotchety. Mm -hmm. They're literally like cigar, cigarette smoke and stayed up till three in the morning at the bar, like crabby old dudes. I pride myself on my guide trips to try to be like, funny and charismatic and talkative and ask them questions and get to know them a little bit. Like it's not just go out fishing and be quiet. That's how I would mm. want to experience a, a guide trip. So it's important. It's important life lessons. Um, so after this portion of the Jordan Peterson podcast, we're going to segue <laughs> into the fishing side of things. Let's talk about your marriage and uh, yeah. quality. Yeah. Yeah. Make your goddamn bed. Um, it has been an interesting couple of weeks here because we have this huge swath of the BFLs where we beat the shit out of the Potomac River, the James, and now we're getting ready to beat up Kerr. And then we have, I think it's Helena, whatever the hurricane's name is, mm -hmm. that comes in there and drops this nuke. And it makes it a great time to talk about rising water and specifically lakes and what you're seeing right now. Because, I mean, I think yeah. we talked even before the show, like Smith isn't that bad I mean, compared to shit show that is the Tennessee and Carolinas. Yeah, I think I think Smith being the first in the chain is obviously making it extremely manageable for AEP as opposed to say Bugs Island where it's like, hey, you're the toilet bowl, like we're just gonna send it down and good luck. Uh -huh. um, I think they did a pretty good job managing it. Um, you know, real quick before we jump into that one thing too i did want to bring up because taylor actually asked me to kind of like talk about it or bring it up is she was at kroger today 
Um, and there's like a donation pickup, I guess, every other day here at Smith Mountain. So for anybody that wants to like help with that type of stuff, like she's going to give some baby formula and some of Charlotte's smaller clothes and we'll do like perishables and stuff. But check your local area, see if there's um, donation pickups, because I think there's a lot of that that's probably going to start happening here pretty quick. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, Smith, I think, is, is getting managed pretty good. AEP, in the, the five years I've lived here now, AEP's had two screw-ups um, where they let Smith get way too high. But this one, you know, they drew it down. We were like 793. Um, and I think we did get to 795, but I think we're already coming back down. And then, excuse me, they do, um, you know, they do have the, kind of the dock guys and the pole slammer like barges and, and stuff like that. And the riprap guys go up and they're contracted by AEP to start grabbing um, you know, grabbing the laydowns and stuff that are coming down. So I think we're going to get managed. Okay. Like I said, we definitely have a flash flood warning here right now. Um, but usually it's like 48 hours after is when we see, like when we drove last night, there's a small bridge you drive over at the lake. It's dirty, but it's not like roaring. Um, so I Smith, I think Smith's all right. And then I think Leesville was super low. So they should be dumping it. Like I'm pulling it right now. Yeah. It's we're 793, 74 right now. Mm. Um, which is what we were on the 26th at eight o'clock at night. I think the storm hit the 27th, right? No, no, no. Yeah. The storm hit the 25th. So we're already down over a foot and we're falling at an inch an hour. So I think Smith's going to end up being just green um, with a little bit of with a little bit of mud um, bugs like the pictures you were showing me. Obviously, that place has a lot more water to disperse, um, and that's pretty typical of it. But I think it's going to be managed managed better here than um, obviously like Asheville and and Boone and like Lake Lure. Will was sending me while I was gone that Lake Lure Dam was under like red alert of potential failure. Um, which was crazy to think that it's insane. It, it is crazy to think. I mean, you think about like, it's like Hollywood type shit. Like no one acts like in, in my mind, Taylor was asking me, she's like, well, how, what would happen if a dam broke? And I'm like, well, imagine honey, if like Smith mountain Lake broke, like we could walk out there like an hour later and there would be no water in Smith mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's just like, she was like, man, that's just, that's, I'm, it's a hard thing to comprehend. Um, so it's just crazy to think that stuff and, and i think about this all the time a lot of these dams and stuff dude they were like built yeah. 50s 60s 70s like well, and that's a great segue because i talked to the army corps of engineers this summer about kerr and that was built during 1944 in world war ii and and smith is a young man at like 50 years old like right it's so and imagine if Kerr break broke eventually, like, yeah, like some of these dams. And again, I know we complain about infrastructure and all this other stuff, but yeah, they're a hundred years old, mm -hmm. but you could kill so many people if let's say Kerr, cause it's a big reservoir, if that thing broke, what that would do downstream would be insane. Yeah. I just, I, I think about that a lot in the form of like, you know, I can remember in like Katrina, like, um, causeways breaking or whatever the, the berms or whatever like that was obviously those, those are sea level type fields, but. I don't know, dude. I think about that sometimes. I'm like, in my lifetime, is a dam going to break in like the town down below the lake that's got 18,000 people and it's just going to get wiped off the planet like in an hour? Probably, but I'm a pessimist because if yeah. you look at what happened at Baltimore with that bridge, I mean, they'll complain, yeah. they'll throw money at it, but it'll take a decade for it to get fixed. Sure. That's what they do. Yeah. It's sad, man. I mean, I, we spent a lot of time in Boone um, and Ash we've done Asheville a couple times, but... I think um, another buddy sent me today. There's 400 roads that were washed out in mm. North Carolina. So. I mean, there's places in, in Appalachia that like they have not had contact with for yeah. what a week or so. It's like it's yeah. insane. Yeah, that's nuts. And, and trying to take it from the the darker thing to the more lighthearted sure, is sure. When, when we go from how much of this is when we're talking purely fishing here. It's like fishing in the cold. It actually bothers the human more than actually the fish. When yep. we see these high water events, is it kind of like the cold where we're like, well, we're telling ourselves they wouldn't bite, but no, they don't, they don't care. Here's how I have always broken down high water and then we can, we can pull up some picks and kind of look at it. So my general rule and especially in the Southeast is the high water usually happens this time of year, which is the hurricane stuff. So there's a couple, there's a couple benefits that are actually from this much water coming in. Number one, 
and I think this is going to hit it right on the head, is turnover. We were queuing up to have just a shit turnover at the lake. Like fish were scattering. I smashed them up shallow and fished for two days shallow and never caught another fish shallow. Hmm. Um, and they were setting up and then the weather was setting up to be that kind of like BS 70 degree midday type temperature, 50 degree nights to where the water temperature just kind of hovers. So I think one thing that is a benefit from this much water coming down, um, is I think a lot of these lakes, especially in the chain right now here, that stagnant water turnover, I think is not going to happen very hard this year. Um, because it's going to take a while for this water to go through the system. And then I think we have a potential for more low pressure tropical storm type of stuff in the next 10 days. So I think, I think as far as the turnover stuff that we normally talk about on this podcast, this time of year, doesn't necessarily have to get talked about because there's a lot of green in Smith Mountain right now. There's a lot of heavy mud coming down way, way up Lake. And that's just going to disperse and, and kind of neutralize that turnover. Um, you know, Does this that. affect the shallow water fish or the deep water population more or the same? Um, I would say it's going to draw, it is going to draw them shallow. Um, it definitely will. There is going to be probably a little bit of a, of a leeway of them to go shallow enough. But what I was seeing um, basically before I left for this, this wedding weekend was uh, I think Monday or Tuesday, I had 20 pounds up shallow. I'm talking like zero to two feet. Um, like I thought it was feeling like damn October. Um, and it was awesome and it was easy. And then literally like Tuesday, Thursday went out and not a single bite up shallow doing the exact same thing in the same water temperature, same water hmm. color. So a lot of that is fall transition stuff, but I saw a lot of fish push back out on main lake points and stuff like that. So Here's how I would essentially approach, like, obviously I, I just got back. I'm going to be fishing all this week, um, is I think by probably Thursday, we're going to see a lot of good color up shallow bait is already starting to make its way back there. It's on the secondaries is you're going to have a lot of that bait run to the bank. And this is the way that I always think about it with high water. That's going to be falling like Smith's already falling. Anytime we get super, super fast, high movement you're rushing water into all those nooks, crevices, dry stumps, all that sort of stuff that is going to kick out nutrients, bugs, um, lizard snakes, like all the fall stuff is basically just got flushed into the water. And it doesn't take that long for the bait to get up there and start eating on that hmm. kind of like microorganism stuff. It doesn't take the bluegills that long to get up there to start eating bugs that got washed out. And then the bass are going to be, are going to be pretty quick behind that. So I actually think it's good that it didn't stay up super high. I kind of like when it kind of flushes up and flushes back down. So that's going to, that's going to dictate my approach kind of this beginning of this week to see if um, some fish kind of moved up on that stuff. And I'm talking like as far back as you can get super, super shallow, zero to two feet. Like it, you'd be surprised that you're not actually seeing these fish that are probably biting your baits. Um, but that water should be nice and green little bit of brown to it um, and have some, have some really, really good color. So I'd be looking for bait in the back. Um, or looking for bluegills or something under docks way towards the back. And then those offshore fish, I think we're supposed to have pretty calm wind until this next big low pressure comes in. So that's a lot of that like schooly top water stuff. And when the clear water at Smith gets green, it's insanely good. So hmm. um, I snuck around just driving around today. It looks like it's on the lower end. It's getting a little bit green, but give it another like day or two. It's probably going to stay green um for five six maybe ten days and that will definitely help the offshore bite as far as them actually like committing to top waters committing to flukes committing to swim baits and stuff like that when the water starts pulling out you mentioned like an inch a day if i'm not mistaken inch how an where an inch an hour okay so even more imperative than the yep. question of do those fish get really like oh it's starting to drop i'm out i'm going back to my initial haunts before the flooding or do they just fo slowly follow the water yeah how I aggressive think, are they yeah because of the time of year i think they're going to slowly follow it back like I, I wouldn't be surprised honestly thomas if the fish don't stay shallow after this hmm. um, and you really start seeing you really start seeing that kind of like first big push up shallow because looking at the extended weather i'm always looking at the nightly lows um, to kind of see how that's going to drop the water temp. Cause I think we get dark at, I mean, it's seven 30, it's pitch dark out there right now. 
Um, so like next Sunday, it's 54, 54, 51, 49. And that's only seven days from now. Or no, that's only six days from now. So if those fish push up in the next three days and then it cold snaps like that, there's no, I don't think they're going to all of a sudden say, hey, we're going to push back out to 20 feet deep. So Outlander and Fishman, the old school thing that he used to say is like w w with spring rains is you get that spring spring cold rain it just shuts the fish off because you got that cold spring mud it, it's a killer yep but when you flip it to the fall side when you have the same situation happen does it matter as much when that cold water that cold rain yes cold, uh, make, okay yeah so like when i go and look in my guide notes like one thing specifically i look at is like sometimes during the years when i guide or the months when i guide i won't take morning trips because the morning bites trash because huh. they just get especially in the spring. So like, let's go through like a spring warming trend, four days of warm by that fourth afternoon, those fish have moved a lot and they're warm. But then that fifth morning is super, super cold. They kind of shut down a little bit because they're just not comfortable yet at that, like say 65 degree water temp. Um, so in the spring and like May time, I might only do like 11 o'clock to dark as opposed to that early, early morning deal. Um, and then the falls, the opposite, once they're up shallow there and they get a kind of a feel of that, oh shit, it's going to get cold. They are going to chomp. Um, and Interesting. They, they know that winter's coming they know that they need to start bulking up. And this is where you're going to see stuff like I grabbed a bunch of baits, but like good crankbait bite, believe it or not, I grabbed a spinner bait. Um, A bigger jig um so all of that is gonna is gonna come into play with that with that cold snap um and then it's kind of the the opposite of the spring in the form of that midday bite when it warms back up that's that like super lame turnover time that's why i hate that like 68 it's a feels amazing outside but 68 degree to 76 degree air temperature that bite time sucks because they go into it, transition yeah. mode they don't eat they just say okay well now it's comfortable so i'm just going to kind of slow down for the rest of the day and i'm just going to sit down it's interesting because i had a guy on the show well, i don't know like a couple of weeks ago that talked about he's from up north and he said the issue with the south in the fall why southern fishermen don't hate the fall is because that window that transition is so freaking long mm -hmm. versus if you go up two states it's a week and it's like mm -hmm. it's winter and they gotta yeah. eat yep and that makes so much sense where we are like that window keeps getting longer the further south you go yeah, um, definitely. I do keep that in mind quite a bit of trying not to make sure I, I, I want to make sure I don't get ahead of them too much. Like I yeah. definitely believe like some bigger fish go to the super back shallows way earlier than we all think. But the bulk of those fish aren't going to go to the backs of the pockets till October, um, depending on how cold it gets. I mean, hell, we're already in October. But um, yeah, definitely keeping that in mind. But that's something I had to learn coming from Minnesota, man, because, yeah, we had fishing seasons, so you would catch maybe a couple off beds the first weekend you went fishing. And then by the next weekend, you're fishing post spawners on a popper and a frog. And then the next weekend after that, you're fishing offshore, like, um, it's where, crazy. yeah, you could have two months at Smith mountain where you're chasing schoolers on, on secondary points before they push to the back and you throw a bus bait. So. And then as always guys, uh, I'm going to be giving away some gift cards to tiger crankbait. So ask you a question, win a prize here. Um, Hey, one when other you look thing, well, go for just it. To, the, the, the last thing I want to bring up, because I know you text me about bugs and I hate that you text me about bugs because I hate bugs, um, is that's the other thing that I would say. So, so Smith Mountain doesn't get it as bad, um, but one of the big things with bugs that I have learned and what I think a lot of guys maybe struggle with is uh, bugs fluctuate so much that there's always a hard spot. It's like the, it's just, it's the juice. If you can get that dialed in at bugs to where, like, if you go up to a point and you scan and know that, you know, the, the point and then down another 10 feet is where the washout is, where you've got a boat sized, you know, rock transition. Mm -hmm. That's where all those fish are going to stack up. That's how bugs lines up, at least for me and how I'm breaking it down. Um, this much water influx is going to move those spots around. So you, if like, you mentioned bugs. I don't know what tournament's coming up. I thought there was a, just a two day down there. I don't know if there's another big one. Uh, there was one last week too. Yeah. I mean, there's always, there's always some there, but I would tell you that, um, I would tell you that it's, 
probably worth regraphing some of those points to figure out if that washout changed um, with how much with how much water is coming in. Um, and you'll have new shallow spots too that'll have like hard spots and stuff like that. So rethinking about the actual like um, I think a lot of guys focus on what the water level is. You need to look at the CFS and figure out how fast the water is actually moving um, as opposed to, hey, it just mm. you want to see like, like how fast it's working through the system because that is going to change some structure. How much will those fish set up like current, like a TVA or just a river system? If the I, I think they set up crazy at bugs like that. Like I throw a crankbait a lot like that. I'm going to have two or three crankbaits on the deck for the next like three months here because I just like doing it. Um, and the great, the good success I've had at bugs is going to be for me has been cranking. Um, and it's been like a spot on a spot. Like you're making a legit, if you didn't have front facing sonar, you would be marking a tree on the bank and throwing a marker buoy out there and lining up behind you to figure out exactly where that cast is. Um, cause I think they do, in my opinion, they set up very similar to like TVA stuff at bugs. I 100% believe that. I mean, it's it's a it's a shitty fishery to begin with, but then when you have all this influx of water, it just makes it another nightmare there. And this is, is why, again, like... in bugs or no? Allegedly. I'm trying to get with the Virginia DWR to talk about that. The spots are getting bigger, though, so that's a thing. I mean, I, and I was arguing with, I think, Chaz about this. I love him to death, but it's like, if you're a F student and you become a D, it doesn't mean I'd be like, oh, okay, this place is amazing now. It's like, yeah. you still ride the short bus. And I there's A-plus lakes within an hour and a half. Yeah, and this is like, and, and you know, my thoughts with the the with the tour, the Bass Pro Tour going to Smith, it's like, if it's once every 10 years or five years, great, because... I know the DWR has put a shit ton of money to make that place good. And yep. I'd rather that place be rewarded than bugs. It it deserves it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I hope it gets better. I just, I dislike that lake very much. What, what do you hate the most about it? <laughs> Nine pounds. <laughs> there. Yeah. yeah. I just, I hate driving four hours round trip for nine pounds. I just hate it so much and I get it like, okay, great. You can go out there and crack 18 pounds sometimes that. And then just the last like two tournaments I've had there, I've dropped like four pounders, like at the boat, four to five pounders. So, well, that would do it too. Um, yeah, just, and, and, and the army Corps will not keep the level near 300. They will never yeah. do that. They're going to keep it lower. There's always going to, there's never going to be a great shallow bite there compared to other lakes where the water is stable. Which is why I think F1s, it'll be harder to do there because, again, if you keep fluctuating the water, mm -hmm. like largemouth need, they need cover, they need grass to be successful. They've done studies about this. So yeah. that's going to be a spot lake if it's going to be any type of lake, period. Um, and the catfish will gobble up those F F1s, man. Yep. And the yeah. catfish in there are insane. Yeah. I mean, like I've, I've grafted before and you think it's a bass uh, when I wasn't great with forward facing sonar, still not. And yeah, they're all catfish you're graphing nine times out of 10. Like it's in, it's almost like the Potomac river. If you've been up near my way, where it's like, there are clouds of catfish. It's insane. Oof. Um, is it Kentucky spots or Alabama? It's a mix. Or? It's a mix of Kentucky okay. and the better ones. Yeah. Yeah. Kusa spots. I just don't think there's enough. I don't know if there's enough bait, not enough fish. Yes or no to both. It's because again, people forget Kerr's big. Kerr's yeah. really big. And I think that's the problem when people say, oh, you catch a good fish or a good sack every now and then. It's like, there's just not enough big ones for the size of the lake. Yeah. Is there a catfish problem at Smith? Like there is at Kerr? No. I wonder why it's it like, um, when fry guarding starts in May, it's like a light switch, dude. I can go crank like brush piles in like five to 12 feet and catch catfish for like six days straight, like, like clockwork, like call my shots and then they're gone. Hmm. So, I mean, I've never caught, I've never caught a flathead. It's, I guess channels, I guess it would be, but I mean, they're all like 14 to 17, 18 inch, um, 18 inch cats, but then they're gone. People, people call me all the time. Like, Hey, where's a good cat fishing pier? And I'm like, not here. Go to a, a random farm pond and see if you can ask the farmer. I mean, that's not a bad thing. It's just interesting how well that like has stayed balanced with everything all in yeah. all. But again, it's, it, it, that's why it's the hidden gem of Virginia. A hundred percent. For sure. Smallmouth fishing. How's that been generally speaking? Um, they're starting to come up. They're starting to be on shoals. Um, Again, we're running in or what I ran into kind of last week was was that transition back out to the blueback herring stuff that you and me beat like a dead horse here. I 
it's definitely was heavy. Um, I think, I think it's going to transition now, but it was a lot of blue back stuff. It was a lot of three inch swim baits, flukes, top waters, little poppers. Um, but there's the lower end starting to starting to pop off quite a bit with some small mouth. They're still wolf pack and there's only like three together instead of it being like eight or 10. Um, but that seems to be doing good. The, um, you know, the large mouth, I guess, I guess we didn't really talk about this, but those two bass King tournaments, the solo trails, um, I didn't even weigh in a limit. The first one was absolutely disgusting. I found some giant wolf packers. I, I practiced too hmm. much. Um, I found some giant wolf pack fish on Friday, um, afternoon and the tournament was Sunday. So I went there in the morning on Friday, fish for four hours, had one bite. And then I had a backup jig dock deal. And the first dock I rolled up to, I lost like an eight pounder. Um, yeah. And then about four docks later, I lost one about four or five. Um, and then I pretty much just mentally checked out because it was about, I don't know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And I think we were done at two. Um, and I should have just obviously went to that, those jig fish. And then the second one, I think I had like three little ones and then same thing went back to, uh, went back to uh, dock fishing and, and I swam a jig out on a suspending blob thinking that it was just like a carp or something. And again, it was like another like seven pound, seven pounder and lost her at the boat. So, yep. So that was depressing. And then I had to run to paddle box real quick to help somebody with a, with a rental. And uh, again, it was like one o'clock. So I just didn't even weigh in and we were leaving for Montana the next morning. So not the best mental toughness ones for me. And I'm not a great jig fisherman. It's, you know, yeah, I, I'm trying to work on it super, super quick. Um, and I what makes you a jig fisherman? That's interesting. No, dude, I can't. I can't. Swim. I can't fish that slow, man. Um, even seeing them on live scope, I can't fish that slow. I'd rather just throw a drop shot and see if they can see if I can <laughs> one out instead of a jig. Um, I get it, but I think I think I've said this on the podcast too before, man. Like these guys that say they caught them all on a jig, full of shit. I've gone out for a week after they say they smashed them on a jig and I've never caught five keepers for 20 pounds on a jig in the same day. It's never happened. They're probably the same person though that casts out, lights up a cigarette, finishes the cigarette, then moves it like still, old school. Still, I've caught two or three like giant one, like keeper fish in practice in one day, but I don't know that I've ever caught 20 pounds solely on a jig um, at Smith mountain. And I have way too many jigs in the garage. I'm just not that, I'm just not that uh, good with it, but I'm trying to force myself to slow down a little bit, but honestly, I'm ready for that to be done. Cause I'm ready for the crank bait bite to pop off. So you mentioned, I practice too much. Was that being a little tongue in cheek or can you actually practice too much? You can. Yeah. Um, there are so many people in the bass opens right now on their keyboards being like, listen, it doesn't bother me to fish 30 days in a row on Ga or Gunnersville or whatever. I mean, dude, if I did the opens, honestly, um, you know, I know, I know Carl Jacobson pretty good. And I think maybe it was his second or third year in the elites. He literally was like, I'm not going to practice full time. Or maybe it was the, the year before he made it in the opens. He's like, I've, I'm practicing too much. I'm stretching myself too thin. I'm not slowing down in areas that have fish. I'm going to practice for two days. I'm going to practice this area. And then I'm going to practice this area. If they're complete trash, then I know I'm not fishing in those two areas. If one area is better than the other. Um, and dude, I have the, I have the double edged sword, man. Like I, I'm guiding, but I'm guiding for two to three pounders every once in a while, a four to five. So if at 1130, I have two, five pounders and I need a limit, I don't go continue fishing for five pounders anymore. I mentally go, okay, let me go get a limit. And I take an hour and 40 minutes or two and a half hours that I should be chucking a jig or chucking a bigger bait for potentially two more five pounder bites to go catch two and a half, two seventy fives and three fives. Yeah. Um, just so I feel better inside. So that's a hard mental thing to break as, as going from guiding, um, to that. And then, yeah, I mean, dude, you gotta, where I probably messed up on that first one is those fish were wolf packing at like one o'clock in the afternoon. And I went through it first thing in the morning being like, Oh, I know there's giant ones around and they probably were around. Um, they just didn't give a shit. So, well, that's a great, uh, G. Okay. Again, uh, if you want your questions shown on the screen, go over to a YouTube or Facebook, uh, Instagram sucks for this, but G three lure says, got to find them on bugs. Easy to catch 25 on bugs. I saw a school of six pounders just cruising on bugs. Why does that happen? They're bluegill eaters. Um, they'll, 
uh, torment your soul. Um, <laughs> so, you, so you, on your deathbed, you'll say, oh, I remember that, you know, 25 pounds that swam in bugs. They're bluegill eaters, bro. Um, they're essentially, they, they might be shad eaters. It's still a little bit early, early for that, but basically they're just cruising the bank and wolf packing um, to pluck off a bluegill. They're hard to catch because they're super spooky um and they can usually see you before you can see them especially what we're talking about with this new water coming in there ain't no chance you know they're they're not going to see you now but you're not going to see them so you can cover water and cover the bank but um they're bluegill eaters they're ambush eaters you got to get the jump on them so you got to go slow on the trolling motor which makes it tough um but you can target specific banks how but- like if you're in a like that's not even like a I get it when you're deep and you can scope and you can hunt but if it's yep. four feet of water and you're fishing how in the hell are you going to be able to like get the jump on them yeah so think about it this way a lot of the forty five degree banks are going to hold are going to hold bluegill and warmouth right now so bugs doesn't have a ton of those so I would be looking more at bugs in the form of like what's back in like the bowls. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's where they spawned. Then the bluegills swam back out to the points and now the bluegills are going back and kind of my point of earlier of like eating the bugs and kind of the crap yeah. that's coming into the lake, any sort of washout or, or, um, pour in right now is going to draw bluegills to it. Um, so you can kind of make the assumption Smith mountain. A lot of the wolf packing stuff happens where those 45s meet red clay. So you can kind of post the boat up towards that red clay and kind of look, I usually fish wolf packer stuff in the afternoon just because they are easier to see because all the fish are nuclear green um but yeah those are those are bluegill eaters baits to try would be like a four inch super light shaky head you know light line and you got to lead those fish by a lot so you're casting 15 20 feet ahead of which direction they're swimming um and i usually just let it sit perfectly still until one goes over and looks at it and then you just pop it in their face so they're easy to catch if you can get the jump on them, but if they see you, they don't care. So we got a good YouTube question here from Randy Purdue. Uh, hey Billy, I'm fishing a uh, smooth down like Thursday. What do I need to be throwing? Um, well, let's look at the weather for Thursday. Hey Thomas, wiggle your mic deal too. You're getting i I'm hearing like a scratch. There you go. Uh, and then Randy, you just won a, a gift card to Tiger Crankbaits. You know, email me fishing at gmail.com. Check check me out on Facebook or Instagram. Just get a hold of me and I'll get that to you as well. Uh, here's a good question. I can answer some. This is Sammy. It is it is easier to fish above the dam or on the chick. Uh, that's the lake portion. Yeah. In the springtime, below the dam's a lot better. Throw that mag draft around there. When those shad really pull up during the run, you'll absolutely smoke them. But they just had the uh, uh, swim bait underground meeting this past weekend, mm-hmm. and they went to the chick place and absolutely. Fr- I had a bunch of friends that went there and they killed them. So go there right now. Plus, you can get a bowfin, which is a lot of fun too. Anyway, yeah, back awesome. to Randy's question. Um, so Randy, pressure is looking a little high. It calling for gusts. That doesn't mean anything. Um, looking like probably top water day in the morning. Um, and then afternoon, I'd definitely start looking at transition docks halfway back. Or I would be looking at laydowns. So I brought a couple of baits and we can we can talk some some dirty water baits too, but um, I'd be looking at laydowns potentially. And then for Smith, be careful, but I would probably go up until you feel comfortable to where there's definitely some serious stain in the water um and back into some of those pockets up there i talked to a striper guy this morning he said there's no debris down to indian so thomas i don't know if you know where that's at but indians up one of the s curves in the river um sounds like the watercolor is pretty good up there i don't think the debris is that much further up from there but i would um i would try to approach the debris line um you don't want to fish chocolate milk you want to fish like pea green maybe maybe a little bit of like a light brown um and then I would I would start working back from there. Um, and then the other thing too with, with this runoff and stuff too, Thomas, is people need to remember this too. There's two sides to runoff. So you have the front edge, which is gonna be a super heavy mud line, um, obviously debris, wood, all that sort of stuff. But pay attention if you can't get out, you know, close to the hurricane, there's gonna be a mud line on the backside where that fresh water is coming back in from just the mountain like springs and the rivers. Um, that'll probably be in like 10 days. Um, but I also like doing that. Like once the debris is cleared enough running up on the other side where that dirty, super dirty water is now turning 
a little bit clearer and green because some of those hmm. fish up there, some of those fish up there are going to be hungry because they're not going to eat. Um, you know, if they, Smith Mountain's pretty clear in the, in the late summer, fall. So if those foot fish up in the river section had seven foot clarity and then they have two inch clarity for five days, um, they're probably, they're either going to bite really good in the mud or they're not. And then as soon as that kind of second wave of, of clearish green water comes in they, they might chew up there too. So that is interesting. Exercise huh. safety. Yeah. No, absolutely. And then to all my kayak guys, um, I'm going to be doing a separate stream on that about kayak safety during flash floods and stuff. Uh, I have a big time game plan with all the crap I wear. I have a one of the little beeper things too, because you could get in a flash flood and in a kayak that would really suck. Yeah. So be, 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 be really safe. Uh, before we get into the basic, these two questions here back to back about Gaston. Uh, what's your opinion on Gaston? And then does Gaston fish like Smith Mountain Lake? Seth? I would not be the person to ask that, my friend. I have never fished Gaston. I have done a bunch of research on it, but I have never gone there. It sounds like it's got a good largemouth population coming yeah. back, um, and the spots in there are a little bit bigger. Uh, I've actually done weddings at super nice houses on Gaston and looked and been like, damn, I should have brought a fishing pole and stayed a day. Um, but I would not be the guy for that. It looks like it sets up kind of, I would say, like a hybrid between Smith Mountain and bugs it looks like it's got kind of that flattiness of bugs and that super offshore kind of blue backy type of stuff but i know it's also loaded with brush it's yeah and, and so i actually as a, as a kid in high school we vacationed there a bunch and so when i was a kid it was loaded with grass 25 pounds largemouth and then the homeowner association decided to just nuke it all and there is still a largemouth population there but the spotted bass have really come in strong with the weights and i think that's because the water level there stays stable compared to kerr so the the out the smallmouth bat or the spotted bass for some reason they just are growing bigger there right now and i think it's because of the brush because of the blueback because of the water staying stable kerr is so effed because they move they fluctuate that water so much yeah. there it really messes with that ecosystem yeah you'd think a lot of these bigger tournaments too would would start expanding out i mean it's it's got to just be the politics it's just the boat ramps yeah. and the, the acreage yeah, I just absolutely preach that. Yeah, and then I've got my mic there. And it might be the cricket in the background there, Randy, which is okay, because when this gets re-uploaded, I'll be cleaning up the audio, so there won't be a problem there if it's just that stupid cricket, which I'm not going to spend an hour trying to find that bitch right now. No, it's um, like a crack. It's not a cricket. Uh, like continuing, a let's see. Do, 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 do. Where's the next question? Oh, here we go. How big a bass mm. do you think it will take for the big bass this weekend at Smith? Is it this weekend? Apparently. Let's look that up. Uh, who owns it now? Cabela's? Let me check. Yeah, Cabela's Big Bass Tour. Big schedule. You ever fished one of these? I, is it worth it? I don't know. It looks fun. I would do Norman. How, have you fished it? You can. Why Norman? I can't fish Smith Mountain. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a pretty hardcore guide rule. Um, it's not this weekend. It's 18 20th. Um, it's going to take a giant one. So I think the lake will be cool enough by that time that there'll be, um, it's definitely going to be one shallow for sure. Um, probably either top water or jig or crankbait would be my guess depending on if we get any sort of like weird hurricane stuff um definitely i would say over eight for sure over eight pounds i looked back in my fishing notes um today talking to a buddy and i think caliber of fish switches like that week from where my guide clients are catching like three and a half to fours to like somebody's catching a six once a week hmm so eight pounds, dude. Like, I, again, I'm just thrilled that we actually have a place that we can talk about that. Again, we, we bitch at Kerr where, you know, you catch nine pounds, you cash a check to this place where dirty thirties were close to like that being the norm here for a BFL. I know it's weird that they're the same water system too, um, but the amount of people asking about, speaking of this, <laughs> how people that are asking this question here on Instagram, or anything. if you were fishing bugs island this weekend, what part of the lake would you fish? 
Well, uh, let's let's clarify one more time. Bug sucks ass. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know if Thomas, if you want to pull some pictures up, cause I haven't looked at it. Um, and I haven't looked at lake level or anything, but I would assume it's still going to be pretty high, um, unless they're ripping it through the dam. So if it was me, I would stay away from anything above the bridge. I would probably be in nut bush or, um, yeah, I mean, if it was me, I would probably be in that bush, hoping that that's the, again, going back to Smith Mountain, when clear water fish get stained water, it's ridiculously good. Um, so that is the way I would do it. Um, maybe Rudd's is holding up, but Rudd's also has a ton of clay in it to where it could probably be pretty dirty. Um, and then maybe, maybe you go down towards the dam, but I would definitely not go above the bridge. It's going to be, it's going to be freaking milkshake. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, basically I would also say Nutbush as well from my yep. little position, just based on everyone that I've talked to. Plus Nutbush has like the best population for consistency. Um, even when the elites uh, went there for the open, like that's, that's where so many tournaments are won. Yeah. It's, it's retread location. It's a big enough ecosystem that those fish never have to leave there anyways. And, uh, yeah, I would, I would be ready for fish being up shallow, man. I would go, I would, if it's still up in the bushes, I would definitely go chuck a spinnerbait around quite a bit. This is queuing up to be a, a spinnerbait kind of weekend. And then, um, probably some top water stuff offshore and, and flip something dark into the, every kind of little nook and cranny you can find. Yeah. Again, guys, it's just, if, if this weather was different, I mean, but again, this is like what happens when they keep going to occur at this time of year, which again, makes no sense to me why they would do this. I remember one year I fished, I guess the ABA opens back in the day when like they actually had really good payouts and we were in November just to avoid all that. I think it was because it got blown out because of a hurricane, but the fishing was banging there in November, like November yeah. around here is actually really good. Yeah, I love late October through January, dude. These lakes are awesome and the fish aren't as deep as everyone thinks they are. I know a lot of guide clients that I take out are expecting us to be 30, 40, 50 feet deep. And I'm like, guys, they're in like five feet. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's kind of the the comfortability of of that water temperature. I mean, if, if fish are comfortable in that 55 to 60 degree water, the water's not going to be below 50 until it's January. So exactly all right boss man uh I, I know i don't want to keep you all night we're gonna get through like a couple more i get the really sure. last one here just to give big dtv his thing shout out to billy for tips he yeah. gave me uh before the second place he got at kerr huge shout out boss you had a great great year yep. this year as yeah he did he did great he adjusted quite a bit it sounds like um going back to um the guy that was talking about the bluegills cruising i think i talked to him and he said he skipped a skipped a bait up under a dock and then like two or three docks later that's like textbook September jig fishing um, for blue get for bluegill eaters um, is skipping the shallow side of docks and all those fish are doing is cruising up and down the bank looking for uh, looking for bluegill. So it's hard to do and it's hard to be consistent with that. But when you find fish in September um, on a jig on the shallow side of docks, it's usually it's it's usually a big one. I think you won big fish for the tournament too. So D, that's freaking awesome! Congratulations, dude. Um, as always, guys. I mean, again, like. Billy, just g give everyone your information here. Do sure. you have any guiding uh, available right now? What's going on? Yeah, so um, the f guide business is Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Service. Super, super easy. Um, anybody that's looking for weekends, kind of rough on weekends till we kind of get through Thanksgiving. But kind of like Thomas just said, if you could, if if you have the balls to do it, you got the warm weather gear to do it, or the cold weather gear, I guess, to to stay warm. Um, and you want to try that winter time fishing, I should say late fall cause it's, it's late fall in Virginia time. Um, there's some really, really fun power fishing type of, of days that I have basically late October through January. Um, and then a lot of guys asking about kind of the Demiki game and the live scoping and stuff like that, you know, that's going to be that December through February, um, type of guiding stuff. But Thomas will link it Smith Mountain Lake fishing.com. Excuse me. Um, again, you guys can check out the check out the paddleboard business. Um, doing real estate at the lake also. Interest rates are coming down. If anybody wants to talk real estate and has been saving money over the last three years of BS and they're ready to 
you know, pull the trigger, we can, we can talk about that too, but life's, life's good, man. Life's good. It's busy, but it's good. Dude. I mean, you've, it's insane how you're able to keep your hand in so many fires at the same time. And then hopefully we'll get some better weather here. As always, guys, please be safe out on the water with all yes. this uh, completely fluctuating water, whether it's kayaking up on the Shenandoah, uh, Susquehanna River or down at Smith Kerr. Be safe this weekend, guys. Like, and subscribe to the channel, uh, and we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Thanks, Bye. Bob. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.